So I would like to start my talk by thanking the organizers, um, Saya and Srija for the invitation and also being very uh, accommodating for my schedule because it's hard to work out a good schedule for the kind of people living almost opposite to the globe. <laughs> so it's my pleasure and honor to give a talk here in the seminar. And I want to apologize to the audience who probably were in the operator theory, operator um, algebra conference two years ago in Bangalore. So the talk I'm gonna talk about has a good amount of overlap with my talk then. But I <clears throat> will talk something recent work at the end of my talk. So what I want to present today is about an analytic growth in the human rock theorem. So I guess about growth in, about the Riemann rock theorem, I guess that's goes the story goes back to the time of Riemann. So his interest was to look at the to count the number of holomorphic functions or maybe meromorphic functions with a fixed type of poles and a fixed type of zeros, right? So that's basically his result and to count the number of independent solutions. And then such a study inspired a huge amount of development in the 20th century of our mathematics, actually in several areas of mathematics analysis, algebras, geometries, a lot of influence. So what I want to discuss today is kind of another facet, another kind of a face of this analytic growth and decrement rock problem. So the, our start, starting point of view is a conjecture actually introduced by Bill Arverson and Ron Douglas. That's about 20 years ago, so around the centennial. So there's a very interesting and a natural index problem arising out of the conjecture. So what do we want to present is some recent progress about this index problem. So what do we want to kind of explain to you in this talk is this very interesting index problem actually connects to several interesting branches of mathematics. In particular, it can be viewed as a analytic version of the growth and human rock problem. So I'll explain to you about this connection in my talk. And I also want to take this chance to encourage, to invite our audience to join our journey of exploring this interesting problem. So I guess people in the audience have a broad background from operator theory and that, I mean, functional analysis, maybe harmonic analysis, um, operator algebra, you probably can contribute to the study of this problem from your aspects, okay? So this work is based on, this talk is based on my joint work with my co-authors. So Professor Ron Douglas, so who kind of introduced this problem, who also kind of very sadly passed away two years, two years ago. And my, former PhD student, Muhammad Jabari, and also my collaborator, Professor Guo Liang Yu at Texas A&M University. Okay. So that's an outline of my talk. And I have to, I mean, before I get into the content of my talk, so I would like to encourage the audience to stop me if you have any questions, because now over Zoom, it's hard to see everybody's face. So if, if you have any questions, please, just open your microphone and just stop me and raise your question. Okay, thank you. So now let's, this is the outline of my talk today. So there are four parts, third, three parts. So in the first part, it's basically a quick review part. I would like to review the Tobolith index theorem. And you will see that our study today is essentially a generalization or extension of this probably well-known classical Tobolith index problem, which probably everybody in our audience have heard, have learned about this. And then in the second part, I plan to explain to you the Arvus and Douglas conjecture and the analytic growth and dick human rock problem. Okay. And in the last part, in the last part, I would like to present you some progress. We, 
we have made in the study of this problem. Okay, okay, great. Let's start the first part. So the first part is a quick review about the classical results, kind of formulated toward our development of our, I mean, indexed problem. Okay, so let's start with the setup. The setup is very simple. So that's a very classical result. I guess everybody is familiar with this. So I will go through this very quickly. So we have, let's draw the picture. We have the complex plane. We have the unit disk. And then on this unit disk, we can consider a holomorphic um, L2 functions. Okay, so we have the usually called the Brogman space. They are just, uh, they consist of square integrable analytic functions on our disk. Okay, so in our study today, we'll use the Lebesgue measure on our Euclidean space. So it's an interesting question to change the measure, but for our study, we'll just focus on the standard measure. And then, so for kind of our audience, we are interested in operators on Hilbert spaces. So we're looking at operators on Hilbert space. Here we have a very nice operators, just multiplication operators, right? So we have the coordinates function, then we have this type of multiplication operators, which is usually called the Toblitz operator. So then, this probably is kind of the key property in our study of index problem for Toblitz operators. So the idea here is, well, if we consider the classical L2 space, not the Bergman space on the disk, then we know the, multiplic the multiplication operator MZ defined in the same way actually is a normal operator, right? So the adjoint of MZ, the on C is Z times C. The adjoint is just to multiply the Z bar and then we have the Z, MZ commuted with MZ star. But now on the Bergman space, our operator TZ is not normal anymore. But now what kind of a replacement of this normal property is, it's almost normal. That's the kind of property we have. So the commutator is not zero, but a compact operator. Actually in here, you can even I mean, have a ref more refined result. The commutator actually is a trace class operator. Okay, so that's the property we have. And now with this kind of property, we would like to formulate a kind of an operator algebra approach to study of such turbulence operators and the index problem, okay? So to do that, we will introduce a few algebras, sister algebras. One is the compact operator algebra on our Bergman space. And then, well, we're interested in this TZ, the Toblitz operator. So you can consider the algebra, unital sister algebra generated by TZ and the compact operators. So this is a nice sister algebra. And this sister algebra certainly contains our compact operators as a sub algebra. Actually, it's a ideal. Right now, you can ask about you know we can we have t we have k, it's ideal. So we have a quotient. Actually, the quotient can be identified. The quotient is the algebra of continuous functions on the boundary of our disk. So here the boundary is really the geometric boundary, the the, the circle. So we have the extension, the short exact sequence of sister algebras of unitals. Oh, sorry sister algebras, not unit, okay? So you can see that we have this Toblitz algebra is extension of CS1 by compact, right? So this is an extension of our C of S1. So in the framework of brown Borglas filmer this defines as a key homology class of our topological space, the circle. So, this is a k-homology class and natural question is, well, can we identify this geometrically? So this question can be raised and answered. Well, here on this circle, there's essentially only one interesting differential operator, the differentiation operator. So now the kind of the k 
k-homology formulation of the classical Toblitz index theorem is to say that this extension class actually equals the k extension class defined by this um, differential operator, this Dirac operator, self-adjoint Dirac operator. Okay. So this is the differential operator for approach to k-homology class. This is the extension class we have. Okay, so that's the kind of um, case homology approach to the topological, sorry, to the Toblitz index. And now we want to generalize our study from the disk to higher dimensions. And then we can introduce our discussion of the Alvarez and Douglas problem. Okay, so to the extension is, well, we have now several dimensions. We have CM and also the unit ball. So here is CM, we have complex M dimensional ball. So this as a real dimension is actually, you know, actually 2M real dimension. So again, we can talk about Brugman space. That's the Hilbert space of square integrable analytic functions on the ball, okay? And now before we have only one operator, that's the multiplication with respect to Z. So now we can have several variables of cm have z1 z2 zm so we have m functions we have m multiplication operators so it's a kind of several multivariate operator theory now and we can see that tzi commute with tzj right because the multiplication do commute okay now we can ask how about the adjoint well, the adjoint satisfy the following property, like this, okay? So TZI do not commute with TZJ star, but modular compact, they do commute. And this is the compact operator, and this is what we call as essentially normal. Okay, let me write. And in general, if we have a Hilbert space equipped with the operators like this, so it's a module of polynomial algebra satisfy this property, we call it an essentially normal Hilbert module. Okay, so that's what do we have for the higher dimensions. Then we can extend what we just introduced for one dimension case to higher dimension. Okay, so for the higher dimension, we can consider Again, this Toblitz algebra, which is the unital cyst algebra generated by this collection of operators together with compact, right? And then we have, again, the kind of the quotient. The quotient can be identified with continuous functions on the boundary of our complex ball. So our complex ball has 2m dimension, real dimension. So the boundary is actually the real 2m minus one sphere. Okay, so we have the similar extension class, extension short exact sequence, and then we have K homology class. Now, actually on the other sphere, there's a very natural Dirac operator as a generalization of the operator we just considered one over I dd theta. This is the spin C Dirac operator. So what is it? This is the kind of operator coming from the residue of the cauchy riemann equations. So it's a kind of a debar operator, okay? And now the index theorem basically says that our Toblitz extension is really this differential operator. Now you can use this one and together for the, oh, sorry, for this ge geometric differential operator, we know we have the classical, now well-known Atia Singer. Index theorem. So we can use the Atia Singer index theorem to compute the index of this um, geometric operator. And you, this one, we can obtain the Toblitz index theorem. Okay. 
So that's how our study is related to the classical Atiyah Singer index. Okay. So now as a remark, so such a study is not just restricted to balls, we can extend it to more general domains. So we can consider complex manifold with strongly pseudo-convex boundaries. So what do we kind of require here? So such a property just to say that on our space, there are many, many holomorphic functions. Okay. In, so with such a condition, the boundary is convex, now strongly pseudo-convex, then the properties, the, the such an index theorem has a natural extension. That's the result of Baudet de Monwell in the late 70s. Okay. So so may, so may I just interrupt for a sec? Sure, of course. Yeah, yeah. so this extension looks like a kind of pseudo differential extension, right? All mm -hmm. like that middle algebra is all pseudo differential operators. So are there any connection? Oh, that's a good question. So here it's about the Tobolis operators. Yes. And you can also talk about some pseudo differential connections. And then you can also on the, then here, this one has to be replaced by the co-sphere bundle. Oh, okay. And then on the co-sphere bundle, you can also talk about a spin C Dirac operator. And there you can also have a K homology class, yes. So this extension also, is kind of sub extension of that big extension, kind of, big um, well. <laughs> no, no, not, not really. So this is about the Tobolis operators. So, the pseudo differential operators, I mean, Tobolis operators are in general are not pseudo differential operators. Mm, okay, I see, I see, I see. Okay. Okay, thank you. Yeah. You're welcome. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, perfect. Now let's move to the second part with a kind of a review of what we had before about Tobolis operators. Now we want to study the generalization of the Tobolis operators on the balls to actually some sub-modules or ideals, okay? So to introduce our study, so we, I've already mentioned this, now let me get back to this. So on our Bergman space of the ball, we have a module structure. The module structure is we have these, they are polynomial functions of m variables. And this is a nice, I mean, algebra is also a subspace of the Bergman space. They are continuous on the ball, so they are integrable, right? And also L2 integrable. Now, what we can do is we'll choose a ideal. So this is an algebraic ideal, right? So A is the kind of algebra I mean, of M variables, polynomial algebra, we have an ideal. Now what we are considering is, we consider the closure of this ideal inside our Bergman space. So this is a kind of a subspace, a closed subspace of our Bergman space. And simultaneously, this is actually a Hilbert space, I bar, right? This is also a Hilbert space because it's a closer subspace of our Hilbert space. So now using the ideal property, we have the following observation. What's the observation? Because if we consider the Tobolitz operator TZI, we can preserve this I subspace. Because give us any element in I, is ideal, so when we multiply it by zi, it will be still in our ideal. So now with that property, we can see that the i bar is an invariant subspace with respect to our Tobolis operators, tz1 to tzn. They are all invariant. Okay. So with this observation, here is a natural question. What's the question? So on the ball, remember, on the ball, we had this property that TZI, TZJ, the air joint, the commutator is compact, right? On the ball. Now we're asking that what happens if we restrict our operators to the subspace? 
to the IB. So the conjecture um, introduced by Bill Alverson around 2000 is that these commutators are all compact. And such a mod, such a property is what we will call, again, let me re remind you, the essentially normal. I'm gonna use this terminology throughout my talk, okay? And so here is a kind of a quick brief history about this conjecture. So this was introduced by Bill Alfson and then refined and studied by Ron Douglas. Now it's often recall, I mean, kind of um, referred as Alfson Douglas conjecture. So this is the I mean, operator theory pro problem. We will be interesting. You can see that this is a natural generalization of the Toblitz index problem, Toblitz um, operator problem to the kind of several variable algebra and the ideals. Okay. Okay. So, so I mean, in the last twenty years, I mean, this problem has been studied by many, many. I mean researchers and we have no many, many cases. So I want with a short of time, I want to be able to um, review the whole history about the, the study of this problem. So let me, instead of do, mentioning people's name and work, I'll just mention the kind of different areas of mathematics have been used, has been connected to this problem. And hopefully your interest your method will add another line to this study. So the first item is very kind of natural. We are studying operators, so it's operator theory, multivariate operator theory. And then also the second one is also kind of natural. We are considering Bergman space. So there's a harmonic analysis aspect of the study. So it's also involving harmonic analysis and, you know, we saw the index theory, Atiyah uh, Singer index theory. So there's also some geometry involved. And, you know, we have polynomials, ideals. So it's natural to consider commutative algebra, right? So also commutative algebra. And you now this is a kind of another aspect of the study, the partial differential equations. So remember our index problem we just said is the extension class is equal to some differential operators, right? So now this part is really related to PDEs. So particularly the de Bar-Luhmann boundary problems. So, so PDEs is also playing a role here. And also the non-commutative geometry, K-theory, K-homology, as you can see already. Okay, so that's about, you know, the least incomplete list of probably the different areas that has kind of been connected to our study of this problem. Okay, so that's the essential normality conjecture by Alverson and Douglas. So now the focus of my talk today is we want to study the index prob problem growing out of this essential normality conjecture. So for the moment, what kind of suppose that we have this essential normality conjecture. If we have the kind of uh, compact commutators, then we can talk about the index problem, okay? So to do that, I want to kind of introduce kind of the more geometric side. So instead of working with the ideal, I will consider, instead of working at this, I'll consider the quotient. So we have I bar, it's a closed subspace of a Hilbert space. We can talk about quotient Hilbert space. And we have this natural exact sequence of Hilbert space. And furthermore, we know we have our polynomial algebra X on this I bar. We also have polynomial algebra X on the Bergman space. This inclusion is compatible with respect to our module structure. This tells us on the quotient, we have also a natural module structure. Yes. 
So our polynomial algebra actually has a natural representation on our QI. So we can also ask about the operators on QI, whether we have essential normality or not. So the nice property is that the essential normality on this I bar actually is equivalent to the essential normality on this Q bar, okay? So I bar is essentially normal, even only if the I bar, this is like, the, you know, the, because we know the three term property, we have the middle one is already essentially normal. And then by the argument, like the Fudelage Putnam theorem, we can have this equivalence. So this kind of suggests that we can consider this guy. And this one has a closer connection to geometry. Okay, okay good. So to continue, I will introduce some terminology. So what are the terminologies here? We have some symbols. We have the Tobolitz algebra associated to our Tob Tobolitz operators now restricted on our QI, okay? And we have compact operators. And then we are assuming that these operators, they are essentially normal. So we can talk about essential spectrum space, okay? So we have to assume the Arvos and Douglas essentially normality conjecture to have this essential spectrum space. Otherwise we will not have it, okay? So as I said, so for the development in the, for the moment we're assuming this property, okay? Now, here is the, you know, the index problem raised by Ron Douglas. So what Ron asked was, well, if we assume, as I already said several times, the obvious and Douglas conjecture about essential normality holds true for our ideal, then we know it's also true for our quotient space. And then we can have this extension theory class, extension class. The, C star algebra of con continuous functions in the essential spectrum space. And here it's just compact operators. So the wrong question is, well, what is the geometric, what is the K homology class? Geometric realization of our K homology of this extension class, okay? And what, so for example, here is a kind of the connection back to our original, the first example. So if we consider the simplest case, M is one, and then we consider the simplest ideal, the trivial ideal, then we know the quotient, the, the quotient is everything. It's just the Bergman space of the, on the disk. Then the essential spectrum on the disk is the circle. So this is basically the Tobolitz extension. And the answer to Ron's question, to Ron Douglas' question is, well, this K homology class is exactly the Tobolitz index theorem. It's the K homology class defined by the DD theta, one over I DD theta, okay? And what we are looking for is an extension of that to our QI. So this is the index problem we would like to study um, in this talk. Okay, any questions? Okay, so now to get connected to more geometry, let me explain the connection. Why do we view this as an analytic Gothendieck riemann roch problem? So here is a little bit kind of commutative algebra and so algebraic geometry. So given as an ideal, we can consider the natural algebraic set associated to the ideal. So we just consider all the points in our CM such that our ideal vanish on those points. This is the zero variety, okay? The zero set, ZI. And now give us ZI, we can consider the intersection of ZI with the M dimensional ball. This give us a omega I, okay? So the picture looks like the following. We have, this is our ball. This is CM. And our ZI is probably like something like this. And what is our omega I? Our omega I is 
the intersection of our zi with the ball. So this is our omega i. And this is zi. So what do we want to view is our qi is can be kind of viewed as the L2 space on this omega i. Okay. So that's the kind of view we want to take. We want to think about our qi as L2 space or the Bergman space on this omega i. Okay. So now to get more connected to algebraic geometry, what we will assume is we're going to assume we work with homogeneous ideals. So homogeneous means if we have a function f in our ideal, then when we rescale it simultaneously by in you know, a scalar, this new function is still inside our ideal. Now, as the kind of corollary of this property is, now if we have z, z1, z2, zm, they are inside our zero variety. Now, when we simultaneously multiply z1, z2, zm by lambdas, f still vanish on that set. So our z i is closed under c star action, c star multiplication. Now, when we look at the boundaries of our omega i, this boundary of omega i lives inside our sphere. So it inherits kind of a reduced kind of group action. It's invariant with respect to the circle action. Okay. Those complex numbers are um, preserving the law. That's the circle action. Okay. So now when we take the quotient, this is the projective kind of variety. It could be singular. This is an algebraic subset of our projective space. So that's the kind of the picture. Now, this is the kind of classical golden dick riemann roch theorem. So we have an ideal, sorry, we have a natural embedding of a algebraic, smooth algebraic variety inside our projective space. Then we can have the following competitive diagram, okay? So this is in the algebraic geometry framework. So when we talk about the K0, they are using the algebraic definition of algebraic K0 and using coherent sheaves and the complex of coherent sheaves. And here for the A's, they are um, chow group, chow rings. So these are the kind of algebraic version of um, cohomology, of Durham cohomology, okay? And the singular cohomology. And then now what did this golden dick riemann roch theorem tells us, if we have a K homology class here on our YI, we can compute his chain character and then looking at the embedding, the push forward into the projective space, we can do it the other way, the push forward the first I lower shriek and then chain character. This two maps almost commute once we include the right um, correction term, the Todd class or the relative Todd class. So that's the classical golden dick riemann roch theorem. So now what do we are considering? We are considering we have a analytic k homology class essentially here. Okay, that's defined by our extension class. So now we can try to ask this map and then consider this. This would give us some geometric characteristic classes. Okay, so now, you know, when why I, the previous theorem requires why I to be smooth. And in the last 40, 50 years, it has been a really a very active research area. People in algebraic geometry have really made a lot of effort with a lot of development, like intersection homology, perverse shifts, a lot of um, new ideas have been introduced to study to generalize the growth and degree roch theorem to singular varieties. Okay. So the one of the kind of the issue in the class study is well, there's when the manifold is not smooth, then you have to introduce some kind of perversity, then there's no canonical k-homology class. 
a no, no canonical complex to work with. So the geometric fundamental class for YI is not that unique. Okay, so that's the, so now the kind of from, for our point of view, why our kind of study contributed to this framework is, you know, although the geometric fundamental class is not a unique, this analytic extension class, the class coming from the Toblitz operators, that is a canonical natural construction, right? That is a kind of a natural element in the K-homology. So this is naturally defined. So this, so our con kind of a conjecture together with Ron Douglas and uh, Guo Liang Yu is, we think that we would like to view this analytic extension class as the fundamental class of the algebraic variety YI. So YI could be singular, could it be, you know, with singularities, but this class is a natural class to work with. Okay. So that's about this introduction of the Arthur and Douglas conjecture and the analytic Gothendieck Riemann Rach problem. Any questions? Uh, isn't the, uh, this yes. is her messed up. Isn't the fundamental class uh, of a singular variety already defined in algebraic geometry? So what is the conjecture here? I mean, okay. is this a new definition? Are you trying to say two definitions coincide? So, so in the algebraic geometry side, I yeah. don't think it's already, I mean, in good cases, it's defined. Oh, now, I see. Yeah, okay. it's not all defined. Yeah. Oh, so your conjecture then is trying to enlarge the, uh, you know, idea or the, okay, thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> You're right. Yeah. Okay. Okay, good. So that's about this introduction. Now let's get to the last part of the talk. So it's a kind of a report of our studies, okay? So we have recently made some progress. So some are kind of uh, several years old, some are more recent. I will try to explain to you the. So, so the first result here is about the complete intersection case. So that's a couple of years already old. So what do we have studied is, well, we, kind of looking at this generators of the ideal. We have an ideal inside the I mean, polynomial algebra. So it is I mean, finitely generated from the Hilbert GZG theorem. So now we can work with these generators. Now the kind of idea is if the generator set is nice, then we should be able to prove this essential normality. So here is, we don't we ask that the number of generators are not a lot. So it's a relatively, you know, a small gen set of generators. Then we also ask about the Jacobian matrix is maximal rank. So this is really telling us most of our places, our zero variety is smooth, okay? And then we have only isolated singularities. And then this part, this part is telling us the geometry of the boundary is nice. We don't have, you know, kind of a weird boundary kind of behaviors. So with these conditions, so with these three conditions, this one means isolated singularity. This one means our zero variety has dimension greater than or equal to two. This one just tells us the boundary of our zero variety with the ball, with the sphere actually is nice. Nearby the boundary, we have a very nice description. Okay. Now with all this, but one result we are able to prove is, well, we have essential normality for the idea and the quotient. Okay. So now with the essential normality, we can ask about the index problem. So the index problem, what we are able to prove is we are able to identify the K homology class of the Tobolus extension with a natural Dirac cooperator on the boundary. So remember, our assumption here is the boundary is a nice smooth manifold. 
it's actually also a boundary of complex strongly pseudo convex manifold. So it has a natural CR structure. We have a natural spin C Dirac operator. So we have this D, like the generalization of what we introduced at the beginning of our talk, the Toblitz operator on the circle, on the disk. So here it's a nice case. We have everything we kind of kind of can see from the example of Toblitz operator. So that's the joint work with Ron Douglas and Guo Liang Yu. So then so here are a few remarks. So after we developed this result, so one, so this result actually was improved by Ron Douglas and E1. So Ron's last PhD student. So what they are able to show is our assumption about the dimension actually together with the Jacobian matrix assumption can be improved can be improved into one kind of geometric assumption. Just ask that the zero variety to have isolated singularity away from the boundary. So we cannot afford to have singularity on the boundaries. Once the singularity is away from the boundary, I mean, the result still holds true. And all, but again, we need to assume that the intersection with the boundary is transverse. So their method is quite different from our method. So here their method is using, I mean, the functional analysis and, and also harmonic analysis. And our method is more geometrical and PDEs. Okay. So this is also closely related to an independent development by English and Ashmeyer under the, I mean, the idea that of geometric Alvars and Douglas conjecture. Okay. And so that's the second remark. And then the third remark is, well, for all the ideals we're considering with these assumptions, they are all radical. So radical ideals in algebra means, well, if we look at, so this is the one equivalent formulation, okay? So if we look at any function in our ideal, it is in our ideal if and only if the function vanishing on the zero set. Okay. So kind of our next development is to go beyond radical ideals, to go beyond examples we just see. Okay. So the, the what do we kind of observe as a starting point is when I is not a radical, then the boundary the information on the boundary is not kind of sufficient to completely characterize this k-homology class. We need some, we need to kind of extract more information in this quotient, Hilbert space, to represent, to characterize the Hilbert, the k-homology extension, okay? So here's the kind of the simplest possible example to see this. This example is, well, the simplest possible long radical idea. So we have, two variables and we have Z, the principal ideal generated by Z1 square. This one is not a radical because we have Z vanishing on our zero set, but Z does not belong to the ideal. Or you can say that the square root, square root of Z1 square I mean, is not inside our ideal. Okay. Okay. So now with this ideal, we can compute we can compute the, can we explicitly identify the quotient, the Hilbert space. You know, it's actually consisting of two copies of the Bergman space of the zero set of our boundary of omega i with a little twist with the weights. So if you are familiar with um, a little bit about the Bergman space, this is a natural kind of phenomena for the weights to show up. And now the, the interesting thing here is actually there are two weights and there are two copies of the Bergman space. So something we have to see is these two copies, but if we only kind of focus on the boundary, we will not be able to see this two as the multiplicity, okay? So with this kind of, kind of phenomena, this observation, we extend that we kind of introduce the following idea. So the idea is, in spite from the following example. So we have what? We have, we want to kind of consider the 
a sequence of nice Hilbert spaces, like Bergman spaces, or maybe direct sum of Bergman spaces. So just now for the Z2, we have again here, this one is A1, but A1 have two copies, right? L2, sorry, let me use, just now we had here, so L2, A1, and then plus L2, A2, this is our A1 in the case of Z1 square. And now in more generally, we may need to go beyond just one term, A1. We need to add maybe A2, A3, and AK, a sequence of them. Okay. So try to see how the monomials structures of the ideas. Okay. So we have to restrict ourselves here. We have to consider our ideal is generated by monomials. So this is a very special class of monomials ideas, okay? And then we can have such a kind of, a, I mean, sequence of essentially normal Hilbert modules by very explicit, I mean, Bergman space type of module structure. And then we can have this long exact sequence. And this one is the replacement of our QI, of our QI. And we will use this kind of whole kind of sequence of modules, extension class, to compute our extension class of QI. That's the kind of idea we want to present in this next result. So this, so this part of the work is a joint work with John Douglas, um, Guo Liang Yu, and also Muhammad Jabari. That's my former PhD student. So, so that's the kind of remark about the structure of AI. Now using this, we can identify the K-homology class. The K-homology class basically says the extension class of TQI is the alternating sum of all the contributing components. Okay. So that's the kind of the Euler characteristic type of presentations of the extension class. So this gives us kind of indirect a two-step description, geometric description of the extension class. So, because now the ideal is not right radical, so there's the geometry is getting more involved. We have to consider kind of a more kind of a refined structure here to present and describe the extension class. Okay, so that's about the radical, I mean, monomial ideals and the non-radical ideals. So more recently, actually last year, with Muhammad Jabari, what do we considered is actually we considered an extension of this result to from the balls to more general domains. Okay. So here is the type of domain we are interested in. So this is what we call, not the what we, we call so in literature, what the people call X domains. So if all the, so here, the PIs are just positive real numbers. And if each P, PI is just one, then we have the standard unit ball. That's the standard Bergman standard ball. But now when P varies, this could, I mean, you know, for example, when P is just one half, then we have instead of ball, we have just, you know, rectangles or more general shapes. So, so what we can able to show is for this kind of domains, the previous pre presentation, pre point, the previous development for monomial ideals, the essential normality and the K-homology class, I mean, description still holds true for such domains. Okay. So now here's a remark about these domains. So these domains in general, they are not strongly pseudo-convex. Remember what I kind of mentioned that the Tobolis index theorem can be extended to complex manifold with strongly pseudo-convex boundaries. For those ones, that's the Bode de Monroe index theorem when the boundary is smooth and strongly pseudo-convex. But now for this type of egg domains, you know, when P's I mean, are bigger, particularly with one bigger than one, 
then it's not strongly pseudo-convex. It's only weakly pseudo-convex. So then in, in general, these boundaries, I mean, so here we have smooth uh, C2 boundaries. And in general, you could also have, when these properties fail, we could have even singular prop, pump, singular points on the boundaries. So such a kind of domain and the corresponding generalizations of the Alvarez and Douglas problem um, is not really studied um, intensively in literature yet. So for weakly pseudo-convex domains, the only uh, can, uh, case that is well studied is the polydisc case. Um, and on um, polydisc case, the kind of result is kind of disappointing in the sense that there are very few modules that are essentially normal. But now this example, this class of examples is kind of interesting. It tells us that we can find another kind of collection of domains. They are weakly pseudo-convex, but they are like the balls. But they are like the strongly pseudo-convex domains. A lot of properties I mean, we have can be extended here. So I think this is kind of a very interesting kind of a, new domains and new probably studies about the, this problem worth looking at along this kind of direction. Okay, so that's a remark about this. And now having all the kind of general theory, general kind of development, let me end with the example. So the example is coming from some classical differential topology. So here we consider choose a special M, M is five dimension. So now we consider a principal ideal generated by this polynomial. And the K is just a natural number, one, two, three, four, five, right? So, and now you can check that with this prop, this expression. Zero is an isolated singular point of the zero variety of PK, okay? And, you know, so what we all do is we just choose a small ball to the zero, and then we choose a very small ball around it. We have this of singularity here, but away from the singularity, our, I mean, zero variety is smooth and it also intersect with the sphere transversely. So all the properties we had for the complete intersection property, I mean, theorem works, holds true, okay? And then we have the, transverse intersection presumption. And then a nice property here is, this is from topology in the 60s, you know, studied by Briscoe. That's a, the name is kind of related. Brisk, they are called Briscoe varieties. So you, when we look at K goes from one to 28, all these intersections, they are all topological seven spheres. Topologically, they are all same. And they are inherent, they are equipped with the natural differentiable structure as the intersection of the zero um, algebraic set with smooth algebraic set with the nine sphere. So it has a natural differentiable structure, but it's kind of a remarkable result that, you know, although these seven spheres, they are all topologically same, but the smooth structures are all distinct when we change K from one to 28. And that's exactly, you know, the Muner exotic spheres, all the different 28 differentiable spheres. Okay. And now, you know, let's kind of see how our result can get connected to this. So as I said, we will consider the principal ideal attached to this PK. And then we have the, all the assumptions we have for this ideal, I mean, they satisfy the complete intersection properties. So we have the K homology class well defined, and then we can identify this K homology class with the Dirac operator on the exotic seven spheres. So they are having natural CR structures, so we can have natural Dirac operator K homology class, they are equal. Okay. So you can see that um, topologically, we are able to identify this extension class. Now, let me kind of end with a question, an open question to our audience. Probably you can help from this, your aspect. So you can see that our K homology 
is able to detect the topological I mean, operator here. But on the other side, our K homology class does not really detect the one, two, three, four, five to 28. Does not see this different smooth structures. So now the question I want to end is, well, can we find some beautiful and more refined analytic environments to detect these smooth structures okay, from our operator theory study. Okay, let me stop here and thank you for your attention. Okay, thanks a lot for this very insightful talk. And uh, yeah, so is there any questions, comments? You can just unmute yourself and ask. Yeah, um, um, I, I have still a question. Uh, about the conjecture and the very interesting example that you had with the non-radical ideal. So if you look at the uh, Tarkley's class, uh, in the example of the non-radical ideal that you discussed, uh, yes. what does that exactly say in terms of your conjecture? Does it, uh, does it fit there? Uh, the, so, uh, you, have so class, this, you have the Tarkley's class in yes. the non radical ideal example. Yes. Yes. Uh, so, how does that relate to the fundamental class? Uh, is that. Oh, that, oh, very good question, Gorda. That's a very, very interesting question. So, the answer is I do not know about the geometric fundamental class. Yeah, okay. So that's why I was wondering, I, I don't recall it right at this moment, but um, there there was some work, that's that's exactly why I asked, uh, because there was something by either Griffiths, Griffiths and King, or maybe uh, Passare, Michael Passare, uh, which um, around mid 80s or so did discuss um, the, the fundamental class with multiplicity in particular. I, I, I think if I look at the, uh, you know, papers, they're very interesting papers and they should relate to, to what you are saying. I'll, I'll send you the reference. Like, yeah, thank you, yeah. yeah. Please send me those references. I'll be very interested in studying those because I think, you know, this should be related to the algebraic charm geometry developments there. Sure, I, I, I think there is something, but I'll, I'll try to, yeah. Okay, thank you. It was very thank interesting you. talk. Thank you very much. I mean, great, uh, yeah, thanks, yeah. Thank <clears throat> you, yeah. nice talking to you. Yeah. Are there other questions? A little question in the chat. Oh, yes. Can you see the chat box? Yes, I can see the chat. Okay. So you have a P, two P sub J. We have a two. So, so you see, which, you which, took uh, mod ZJ raised to two PJ and then summed it up. So, and uh, do you need a PJ is bigger than or equal to one or a half? Oh, that's a very good question. So for the result, we do not need any assumption on PJ. So my remark is just to saying that, well, in, in the case that some PJ are greater than one, then these domains are not strongly pseudo convex. Okay. Okay, yeah, so some of the Domains are still strongly pseudo convex. But you know, when we have these properties about assumptions on the PJs, then the domain is not strongly pseudo convex. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, are there more questions, comments? So uh, I have one question. Uh, is that uh, so? What is this special role played by Bergman space? Like there are other spaces of analytic functions and integrable functions. So, 
uh, uh, how much analysis does we remain the same in those cases? A very good question. I, you know, all these questions can be raised for, I mean, other spaces like, uh, you know, uh, no, you know, other weighted Bergman space or the jury option spaces, yes. different versions. You can ask that. So here we kind of chosen in my talk to kind of talk about the Bergman spaces. Well, Bergman space is closer to geometry. Okay. Again, it's all also related to zero sets. And if we talk about the jury option spaces, then we kind of, well, many results we talk about here still extends to those jury options spaces, the model spaces. But the